Today on Sporty's Fast Five podcast, it's a weather geek episode with flight instructor and meteorologist Scott Denstadt. He shares some tips for better pre-flight weather briefings, why forecast models can't always be trusted, and what he would change about data link weather if he could. Fast Five starts right now. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, John Zimmerman, and today my guest is Dr. Scott Denstadt. He's a former National Weather Service research meteorologist. He's also an author and an active flight instructor. So he is uh, one of my go-to guys when it comes to weather questions because he really understands it from all sides of it. And boy, do I have weather questions today. So, Scott, welcome to Fast Five. Hey, thanks, John. Glad to be here. I'd like to start with a somewhat philosophical question, I guess. And that is, do you have to be a weather geek at some level to be a safe pilot? Uh, You know, some of us, like you, like me, to a certain extent, we like weather, we're into it. Is that a bonus or do you really have to be into weather at some level in order to be a good pilot? Yeah, so that's a question that I I struggled with over the years. When I first started teaching pilots about weather, I thought I had to teach them to be a meteorologist. And as I got more you know, interested in the actual product of my teaching, I realized that that's probably not the best approach. So what I usually tell folks that ask this kind of question is, for instance, let's use music as an example. Um, You can be an excellent musician. You can play the guitar or the piano really, really well. But you may never, ever write a single line of music. That may not, not be your forte, um, and certainly, there's a skill set to be able to write music rather than just play it. So I kind of think of it the same way. Pilots need to know enough weather and enough meteorology to be able to play well and be safe, but I wouldn't expect them to ever learn to do a forecast for weather at like a terminal forecast and such. So, so yes, they need to be able to play the instrument well. That's a fantastic analogy. I had never thought of it in those terms, but uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, And so my natural follow-up question there is, how do we do it that in terms of primary training, whether it's the knowledge test or the check ride or the typical flight school school curriculum, how do we do it teaching the weather part of it? And that's a tough question to answer because in many cases you have to, if you're going to become a private pilot or get a rating or become a commercial pilot or ATP, there's a certain amount of education you need to pass the test and and pass the check ride. And I find over the years that pilots know enough to to do that, but they're not necessarily at a point where they can kind of achieve a level higher. And so you can read magazines, you can read books. Uh, Certainly there's a lot of good literature out there. But um, I find that, that finding really good information on, on the internet uh, is extremely tough. There are a few companies out there that are doing this. I've been trying to do it for the last 25 years, doing some um, kind of weekend boot camps for weather. And, and also, I do a lot of one-on-one training with pilots to, so that I can hear the answers to their questions and respond accordingly. So it's really difficult to kind of get to that next level uh, because I know a lot of the magazine articles I read, some of them are pretty good. Some of them throw a lot of misconceptions into it or just not teaching weather properly. You know, I focus a lot on not thunderstorms, for instance. I focus on showery precipitation as kind of the, the concern because when people see showers and pilots look at the forecast and they see showers, they may not see the threat that I do, and that is showery precipitation is a convective process. So how do you find that, that level of knowledge? And it's really difficult to, to do overall. And I wrote a book, um, Pilot Weather from Solo to the Airlines, to help with that. And I knew that that was something that the industry as a whole um, had a book, Aviation Weather, from uh, that was written by Dr. Lester, published through Jeppesen, has been on the market for many, many years. But it really needed a an upgrade, and and I wrote Pilot Weather from Soto Airlines along with Captain Doug Morris, 
who was a Boeing 787 for captain for Air Canada, to kind of get to that next level to provide a reference guide for pilots. And how much of this education and weather needs to happen just from the left seat? I mean, at some level, do you just need to get out and fly near weather to understand it? Yeah, that's that's one of my pet peeves. I hear that all the time, usually from the uh, the older pilot population. And I'm not talking about necessarily uh, age wise, but those have been you know in the uh, aviation um, and flying for many many years. Uh, that yeah, just go out and fly more often. You'll figure it out. Um, I don't prescribe to that. I do know that uh, experience is important. I'm not suggesting it's not. What I like to do is when some, a pilot learns something about weather and they apply that and then they fly that with that knowledge, that applied knowledge is really valuable experience. The thing I worry about is that pilots get themselves into trouble. They've never experienced icing, for, in, for instance. They get up in the clouds and they think, based on what they've read or understood, that they're, they're safe to do so. And they realize that when they get overwhelmed by icing, that was probably not the best choice. And they didn't realize, they didn't understand that environment they were flying within. So I think a lot of it is a combination of learning, education, and then flying with somebody like a CFI or a maybe a mentor pilot that has been in weather for many, many years, and then eventually, as you start to get more and more access to a more significant weather, more challenging weather, that's when that becomes, I would say, more relevant from a long-term learning perspective. And that's probably, to, to me, the kind of the safest way to do it. Yeah, I think you make a great point there about flying with somebody else. And it doesn't have to be a flight instructor. You mentioned mentor pilot. I think sometimes there's a lot to be learned from that as well, that somebody who can ride along in the right seat, who's got a lot of experience flying and weather, and maybe they're not a current or ever a flight instructor, but they can still offer value. So something to remember for sure. Uh, I'm interested in your latest project. It's a progressive web app called EZWX Brief. And you say on the website for it that the goal of that tool is to end VFR into IMC accidents. So obviously this is something you've spent a lot of time researching and thinking about. Why do you think that continues to be such a persistent problem in general aviation? Yeah, it's, it's something I've been struggling with for many years. When I first became a pilot and an instructor, um, I, I just could not understand how pilots could get themselves into such a bad situation. And you know, that ate away at me for many, many years. And, and certainly there's a lot we can learn from reading accident studies and such. But I decided to really put my head down and learn as much as I can from the industry, looking at statistics and, and reading a lot of journal papers, and eventually incorporating that into my dissertation. Uh, and so I spent three and a half years really you know, struggling with understanding why pilots get themselves in this trouble. And there are a ton of, of different aspects to this. You know, we know that Pilots are not aviation, you know, meteorologists, you know, and I think a lot of it also has to do with how pilots consume weather and all that weather guidance. A lot of the apps out there just throw a bunch of data at the pilot and the pilot's got to kind of, kind of figure out how it all fits together. And that can be real difficult for especially pilots that don't have that many hours and don't have a lot of experience or receive some really poor training in weather. And so the VFR and IMC problem also extends itself into kind of the data and the weather guidance that's available. Normally, we have a pretty good forecast for our departure airport and our destination. So we may have a terminal forecast. We may have a MOS or model output statistics forecast, or maybe we use the graphical forecast for aviation for understanding what's happening at our departure or destination airport. The problem we see is that there's not a lot of good information between those two airports. And we're making a 500 nautical mile trip and we're using airports that are close to the route, 20, 30 miles off the route to kind of see what's happening, really starts to put, put us into a position, a compromising position, especially when we're dealing with um, you know, uh, mountainous terrain and such. 
Um, those, those airports are not really all that close together in those areas. And to get a pretty good understanding of what that weather is along the route of flight, especially those that fly a lot of VFR, uh, there's a lot of gaps in there. And so I thought, you know, the way that we have done briefings for years and years was to just literally find those close by airports. And that's what we're briefed with. And most VFR into IMC accidents occur in that cruise or in route phase of flight. Um, and that's where we see a lot of that, those, those issues that come up where pilots don't have the details uh, to make good decisions. And so one of the products of my dissertation was to develop this progressive web app, Easy Weather Brief, and not only be able to kind of look along the entire route of flight at the weather, with a high resolution amount of, of weather guidance at, let's say, at two and a half kilometers, um, but also be able to add the, the pilot's personal minimums to that. And, and that kind of rolls together so that the pilot has a chance of quantifying the risk that they're about to take. And so now they not only have the ability to see the weather through a route profile depicting the clouds and icing and turbulence along the route of flight, but they have the understanding of that we have a high resolution guidance along that flight that's looking for those hidden areas, if you will, along the route that may crop up if you're actually making that flight. So it gives the pilot the advantage of stacking the deck in their favor ahead of time to find the best departure time when it meets all your personal minimums. I remember being told by a, an early flight instructor that one of the best tools you had as a private pilot was the decision to not go or delay your flight, that you're not locked into a schedule and sometimes that makes a difference. Uh, and I think that's certainly true what you're talking about, not just look at what's the current conditions, but when might be the right time to leave. Um, and, and so I'm wondering about your pre-flight weather briefing. Obviously, you know, you have a vested interest in this and in the tool you've developed, but from a bigger picture, what are you looking at? You know, if you're if you're briefing a flight or maybe said better, what should a typical pilot be looking at beyond just a you know a METAR or a TAF? What are what's a what's a process for them to follow? Yeah, that's a that's a very complex question. Um, and I know pilots like an easy solution. Uh, and it's it involves not only looking at those TAFs and those METARs and maybe a skew T log P diagram or two. But it also involves understanding that big weather picture, kind of what's driving the weather. I think most pilots tend to focus a lot more on details, like pulling out certain pilot reports, looking at certain surface observations or TAFs, and they're missing the big picture. What is driving the weather? What is the primary focus of that? And in my own briefings, 99.9% .9 of those decisions that I make, whether to go or not, and the route I'm using, and maybe even the altitude, is driven by that big weather picture. And, and that comes from looking at um, not only looking at prog charts and surface analysis charts, but looking at some of the more advanced guidance that we have now. Uh, certainly, you can look at convective outlooks, which provide a, a pretty good understanding and overview of the broad picture of convection. Um, but I like to also look at upper level charts, constant pressure charts, because really, if you look at a surface chart and, and kind of stay focused on that, that's really only what's happening at the surface. That front that you see on the surface analysis or the prog chart is happening at the surface. So you're probably hitting that front maybe 10,000 feet above the ground. And the weather up there may be totally different than what's down near the surface. And the overall depiction that you get in the upper level features, you know, it stands out like a sore thumb. When you're dealing with a pretty major weather system and you look at a front, how do you determine, does this frontal system, does this weather system have any, you know, pack a punch? And ultimately that involves integrating a lot of information, but you can immediately see an upper level trough that has a really high negative tilt. And I know these are concepts that most pilots are not taught, but a negative tilt to that trough, that's a, that's a pretty significant upper level feature coupled with an area of low pressure in fronts at the surface can produce some serious weather. And most of the folks that I talk to, either somebody makes a, you know, gives me a phone call about an incident or accident or something that they were involved in or an email, normally it's because they've ignored that big weather picture. And I think we, we find pilots end up 
in a in a huge in a, in a bad way uh, because they missed that point. So I'm I'm focused on that. In addition, there's some really good uh, new weather guidance. It's it's been around actually for a couple decades, but it's finally starting to kind of phase into the the, the pilot's pre-flight briefing, and that are that's uh, something called a simulated reflectivity, or you may hear it as forecast radar, which provides a really good temporal and spatial resolution, and it represents it in a way that's very familiar, and that is it represents it like a NEXRAD depiction. And most pilots are pretty darn good at kind of analyzing and understanding the threats when they see a specific NEXRAD signature. And when they do that, and they compare that from a forecast standpoint, it gives them a much better opportunity to make good decisions about timing of when they're going to depart or even their route of flight. So that's kind of what I, I focus on. And should you, do you see value in calling for a weather briefing in 2021 or is it pretty much all self-briefing? Is there ever a time when that's the right decision? You know, I think there are times. Um, I still make a phone call to flight service. Um, primarily, it's to check that box. But uh, I also am very, really bad at, at doing NOTAMs um, and TFR. So I like to have somebody who understands the, the lingo for that. I'm good at weather. I can decode all the TAFs and METARs you want. But those, uh, those blasted uh, um, NOTAMs and such, I like to have them look through it. But in general... Now, I don't think it's a bad idea to, to make a phone call. I And I usually do it primarily to get a last-minute update. I may, I'm just about ready to close the door in the cockpit and depart. And I've, I've got uh, a phone with me, so I make a phone call. want to make sure that there's no there's no things that kind of popped up that I, I'm going to say I missed, but recent things like urgent pilot reports for severe turbulence or severe icing or low-level wind shear. So I do it for that purpose. Um, I don't really do it to learn about the weather because I've already kind of made that decision at this point. Uh, and certainly for some folks that are not very weather savvy, it might not be a bad idea. But just keep in mind that um, that these these briefers are not really, they don't know who you are. They don't know your risk level, risk tolerances. So they throw a bunch of weather information. You still have to kind of figure out how it all fits together and how it makes sense to you. Uh, in 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 that of itself, uh, I find that that's kind of difficult to, to to do for the most part. So I kind of lean towards people making their own self briefings and becoming proficient at that. All right, Scott, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with some more questions. Earn your pilot's license, get current, or add a rating. No matter what your goal is, Sporty's Pilot Training App will save you time and money. It's available on all your devices, including iPad, iPhone, Android, and smart TVs, so you can access Sporty's award-winning videos anywhere. Plus, with automatic sync between platforms and free lifetime updates, you'll always be up to date. Over 25 courses are available, from private pilot to aerobatics, Visit sporties.com slash demo to try it free. All right, we're back with Scott, and I'm interested in some of the newer products. You mentioned a couple of these, but I feel like I see a lot more pilots these days using tools like Moss or SKU-T diagrams or some of these other things that, you know, five or ten years ago were reserved for forecasters. Do you think that's a good thing for pilots that, you know, they've got more information, they can make better decisions, or is there a downside here to potentially a pilot using a product they don't really understand? Yeah, just like anything else, um, I can I can build a house and I can take out a the old-time saw and, and nail and, and, and hammers and build a house, but we have these power tools that help us get the house built quicker and essentially have more accuracy and, and overall you know, probably is, you know, ends up being a better product in the end. So, and the same thing happens with, with weather. I think there's a lot of good power tools out there for pilots to utilize. And certainly model output statistics, uh, skew T diagrams. A lot of this has been around for, for many, many, many decades. It's just starting to get introduced into the pilot population. In fact, when I first started um, my own trek to become a pilot, I noticed that these products were not in kind of the in in the front lines of what pilots would use, and 
that was what I was using. So when I started uh, doing a lot more kind of nationwide training, I started throwing this stuff in, skew T log P diagrams, throwing model output statistics in, because I think they provide a lot of extra guidance to pilots to make good decisions. And you should probably never use a model output statistics as the primary guidance if there's a TAF there, because the TAF is being monitored, you know, uh, pretty much minute by minute to make sure it's actually, you know, producing a forecast that's fairly accurate. And it's monitored by a human being, a meteorologist, who's got a lot of good experience at doing this. Whereas Moss doesn't have any amendment criteria, so it could be way out to lunch, and as a result of that, uh, give you the wrong information. So again, if a TAF is available at that airport, you should use that. Uh, but certainly to be able to drill down, for instance, I'll give you an example. I was taking off out of an airport, uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and, and it was early morning, and there was a twin turboprop commuter aircraft that was reporting uh, having taken off out of Roanoke and experiencing some severe turbulence at uh, 10 to 11,000 feet. And I was uncomfortable with that. I didn't want to get bounced around for the next two hours. And so I used the skew diagram to kind of drill down and see what was going on. And I could tell this was just a thin layer turbulence event that if once I got on top or if I stayed under, I wouldn't be in that kind of significant turbulence. So these are, these are things that allow you to, to add or enhance your briefing. And I don't think there's a problem with that, all except the fact that some pilots don't know how to use this properly, especially skew T diagrams. I've gone on the internet many times, seen a couple of posts put out there by pilots about, you know, uh, they've shown this skew T diagram. And they're like, this is just a horrible diagram. I, I'll never use it again. You know, the, the temperature and dew point are really far apart. And I look outside and there's clouds all over the place. And then they if they look at this as, as a, a diagram that they just don't understand, that's because they didn't understand that those clouds were produced through rising and expanding air that produced cumuliform type of clouds. And that skew T log P diagram was a forecast and therefore was creating or showing you the environment that those clouds were growing within. So it can be a detriment if you don't understand how to use the technology or tools. No different than power tools. If I don't know how to use a router properly, it's dangerous for me to do so. So I like to tell folks that it's a good idea uh, to try to learn from somebody who understands this stuff pretty well. And once they can get a pretty good understanding and, and kind of have somebody watch over their use of this, and I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one online training that, that basically allows for that. And as a result of that, I think it becomes a very, uh, very important tool to make those kind of good decisions before flight. Let's talk about data link weather because that's another weather tool that has, uh, to some extent, been around for uh, 20 years maybe, but has really accelerated over the last five years or 10 years maybe. And more and more pilots are flying with it. Do you think overall that has had a positive impact on aviation safety? There's no doubt. I think if you look back and you look at the, uh, the technology that has entered into aviation, including GPS, GPS is like the transistor, if you will, um, of electronics. Uh, GPS really made navigation easier, the ability to see where terrain is located. Wow, that has really improved safety a tremendous amount. And I would kind of just follow that up with this data link weather. Uh, data link weather has become a necessity for me. Uh, if I head to the airport, I forget my GDL 52, I'm driving back to, to the house to get it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to take off without it. Uh, it's just, it becomes a, it becomes a necessity uh, to the point of, to me, it's a no-go if my data link weather is not, uh, is, is not performing like it should. I've even gone through situations where I've actually landed early to my destination because my data link weather wasn't functioning properly. Could I have made it there? Probably. But it just makes me feel uncomfortable. So, yeah, I think data link weather in of itself has, uh, has created, uh, for the most part, a more a safe environment for, for pilots to fly into. And, and, and yes, there are pilots that have abused that. Maybe they don't understand the latency issue of the next rad depiction got a little bit too close to the weather and ended up in a, in a bad situation, either accident or incident. But yes, yeah, so there are 
temptations to use it you know, in a way that it's not made to be used. But in general, uh, adding to that, you know, maybe a certified ice protection system and onboard radar, boy, we've really got some good tools here that we didn't have 20, 30, 40 years ago. And if you were king for a day, what would you do to make data link weather even better? Well, if I were really king for the day, I would really push hard to get the internet in the cockpit. And not mm -hmm. that, uh, the, not that the, the data link weather doesn't serve a purpose, but once we get data link, once we get the internet in the cockpit, I should say, uh, then, you know, uh, it's it's sky's the limit at that point, literally. So, you know, yes, there there are some things that I would uh, that would change. I would most likely like to see uh, some different weather products in in the cockpit. For instance, I'd love to be able to see uh, simulated reflectivity or forecast radar in the cockpit, even if it's only a couple hours in advance, so that you know you can get a better understanding of where that line of weather, that line of thunderstorms or convection is expected to go, where it's going to be in relation to your route uh, in, in two or three hours. Because we know that, that kind of that two to six hour window is, is where we're most concerned about uh, when we fly. So I really would kind of focus on getting that simulate reflectivity into the cockpit there. But in the end, I think data link weather will be likely similar to VHS and Betamax and even CDs or DVDs. Eventually, that's going to all go away once uh, the, uh, the internet in the cockpit you know, becomes the norm. All right, Scott, at the end of each one of these episodes, we always close with some rapid fire questions in a segment we call Ready to Copy. So I'll throw out some topics and you give me your quick answer. Are you ready to copy? I'm ready to copy. What do you think is the most misunderstood weather product out there? Upper level weather charts. And why is that? Primarily because they it's it's a product that always is thrown out to the to to the pilot as a possible to look at it they just never have had the instruction or the time to do it so when they look at it it's like it's just greek to them they don't have a pretty good understanding of how to how to utilize it and I, like i said earlier i think it's really a valuable product to, to learn how to use possibly related possibly not what do you think is the most underrated weather product for pilots Underrated. Uh, that's 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 the question I've, I don't think I've ever been asked before. Um, I still think that this the the graphical airmets the the airmet concept has been there for for many many years, but then they switched to using graphical airmets. I still think pilots don't spend enough time and energy looking at those, and I, I know that they are they they can be somewhat they can cover a lot of territory sometimes, but they can also help kind of quantify where the tops of that icing layer uh, exist. So I think they, they are probably the most underused uh, product of all. You mentioned icing there. And it seems to me, in my experience over the last maybe five, six years, those icing forecast products have gotten a lot more accurate. Is that just my imagination or is this really improving over time? Yes, it's, think about these, this, issue is there's an evolution of the icing products and certainly evolution is part of what weather is all about because we're starting to learn better about what causes icing the environments that create you know significant icing for pilots and so over the years they've been introducing and and putting you know, uh, uh, adding more elements to this for instance some of the first icing products that were coming out in 2005 and 6 uh, didn't really involve a lot of convective aspects to it. So now that that's being rolled in, uh, you know, since uh, I guess 2011 or 12, now we're starting to see icing that's related to convection, which is probably the most serious icing that's come into play. And so, I, yeah, I think over time, uh, the researchers out there are starting to get a better understanding and handle. And also the forecast models are, uh, are higher temporal and spatial resolution. So as a result of that, the end result is is better information for pilots to make those those good decisions. And is some of that just a function of higher power computers that can be brought to bear on this? Yeah, it's it's a function of that. It's also just a function of of how, you know, you know, how the software is built as well, making sure that they can maximize the amount of of CPU cycles that have to 
uh, take to, to do a forecast. It's also looking at how to pull together multiple forecast models. We call it a, a, a forecast ensemble. So it's not just necessarily one forecast model, but it's a multiple models that are being pulled together. And that's so you can get a better understanding of how confident the model is in the weather. You know, we've seen spaghetti diagrams with hurricanes. Well, the same thing can happen with uh, just basic forecasts and, and also doing post-processing on that data to, to better understand and handle the specific thing you're, you're trying to forecast, such as icing or turbulence. Weather cameras have been a popular tool in Alaska for a few years now, and there's a movement to bring them down into the lower 48. You're starting to see a little bit of that in uh, mountains of Colorado, for example. Do you think that's a good idea long term? Would that help the average GA pilot outside Alaska? Yeah, so going back to what we talked about in VFR and the IMC accidents, uh, certainly they will help out. And when weather changes rapidly, um, you may not pick up on that per se, uh, because if you may be looking at a particular moment in time, but the weather's changing rapidly, you can be, you know, look at it five minutes later, and it's a totally different picture. But it's the en route stuff that's really tough to understand. And if there are you know, tons of cameras along your route, that's great. But what happens if there's only one or two? Uh, certainly, that's not going to not going to really help tremendously. It'll mainly help uh, at your departure and destination airports. Um, more than anything else. You mentioned your book earlier, uh, Pilot Weather, From Solo to the Airlines, which I've read and enjoyed very much. Other than that, are there any other weather books out there you'd suggest pilots read? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've, I've, over the years, read mostly uh, texts that, that are kind of destined for people that are in the meteorology world, learning to become forecasters and such. And so I've, I've focused uh, in my own kind of learning over the years on those elements. Um, I know Bob Buck wrote a nice book on weather. Um, I've read that myself a couple of times. Um, I, I do think that, uh, that the aviation weather by Peter Lester was a good start, uh, provided a good overview of things. And, and certainly, you know, uh, my, my book, Pilot Weather from Solo the Airlines, tried to take that to the next level over there. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's, there's a, uh, certainly a ton of other w folks out there that uh, have, have written these, these, uh, these books on, on weather. I, I really can't say I've read any of them, so I can't uh, give a, you know, one way or another. But I think the, the book by Peter Lester and, and certainly um, – just reading the the new aviation weather um, advisory circuit was updated, I think, in 2016. Actually, is a pretty darn good read overall. And how about for the brave pilot who maybe wants to dip their toe in the water on more hardcore meteorology? Is there a is there a textbook there that uh, is not going to be too overwhelming? Yeah, I I like the book. Um, it's called Meteorology Today by um, uh, by a, a author, I'll spell this for you, A-H-R-E-N-S, uh, is probably one of the better books out there uh, to give you a better understanding of the big weather picture and you know, how fronts work and how upper level features and the tilting of, of the upper level features versus the, um, the surface features. So there's a lot of, of discussion there that you can learn about in that kind of a book. So I, I probably would point folks to that before anything else. You've done a lot of flying in Cirrus aircraft over the years. What do you like about that airplane? It, overall, the Cirrus uh, has been, you know, um, an airplane that's uh, that's easily, from from my perspective, easy to fly. Overall, when you think about, um, I'm I'm a I'm a lefty, so when I was learning to fly for the first time in a Cirrus. Being a left-hander, I found that the stick was very comfortable. I could easily uh, understand and, and get access to be able to f fly the airplane really well, and especially even in, in significant crosswinds. The technology in the Cirrus, and I know a lot of other aircraft have kind of adopted this too, but I know Cirrus in of itself has come along kind of as the, f uh, kind of as the forerunner of a lot of this new technology in the cockpit. 
And there's there's this you know, analysis paralysis kind of thing where you, a lot of stuff thrown at you. But if you can become a, a proficient pilot, um, and not only just in the stick and rudder skills, but also understanding how to use the technology, the Cirrus platform you know has continued to evolve, and you know probably keeps you out of any of the other airplanes out there. And I'm not saying anything bad about some of the other airplanes, but you know, overall they've done a really good job of maintaining. Um, that that technology through their, their the evolution of the of the airplane itself. All right, our last question. It's always the same. You have one final flight, and we want to know what are you flying and where are you going. <laughs> well, I would one final flight. I would probably love to do is um, a uh, a flight in a glider um, because you can really experience for me experience the weather in a way that you can't experience it in any other airplane. The, the lack of sound of an engine uh, just is exhilarating. And to be able to, to soar like the birds um, is, is just an amazing feeling. And so I would probably want to do something maybe um, over the Rockies or uh, over uh, you know, terrain that has some, some beauty associated with it. And I would love to, you know, to, to be able to kind of end my my uh, aviation career you know, flying a glider. Scott, thanks for being on the podcast. No problem, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to Fast Five, brought to you by Sporty's Pilot Shop. For more episodes and links to additional information, visit sporties.com slash podcast. And if you have comments or guest ideas, email podcast at sporties.com. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Fast Five.